All right. <laughs> okay, so um, I am, well, let me just get my Microsoft Word set up. Mm -hmm. So as I say, if you are needing to interrupt, you know, if you need to sort of say something, mm -hmm. um, just do so. No, well, this is not speaker's um, corner, so I will let you uh, actually yeah, if... get to finish your sentences. Well, it, it's like whatever you think official, really. So if yeah. you feel like, oh, I've got to, I've got to ask about this, or mm -hmm. yes. I want to talk, explore that point a bit more, mm -hmm. um, then feel free. Oh, thanks. Um, but otherwise, yeah. I'll just crack on. Mm -hmm. So I will just give you a very. Can I just right. give you a very quick introduction, and then we'll start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, Bob, before we start, you normally like uh, go with, through a psalm or something as a prayer um, for your stream. I do. Yes. What if, what if, what if I, um, what if I, I, I can recite the Psalm 23 uh, in Norwegian, if you want. And I will just... Uh, That's beautiful. Yes. Uh, let's do that. Yes, let's do that. And let that be our prayer. Herre namen hørde, det mangler mange ting. Han la meg ligge grønne enger. Han leder meg til vilens vann. Han styrker min sjel. Han leder meg på rettferdigheten sti av sitt navn skyld. Om jeg skulle vandre i dødskyggens dal, frykter jeg ikke for ondt, for du er med meg. Din kjepp og din stav, de trøster meg. Du dekker bord for meg like for min fine søyne. Du salver mitt hode med olje. Mitt beger flyter over. Bare godhet og miskenhet skal etter jage meg alle mine livsdager. Og jeg skal få bo i Herrens hus gjennom lange tider. Amen. 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 So, good morning, good day, good evening, and good night to you, depending on where you are watching this. Time of recording, it's um, Friday the 13th, which means it's weekend. And uh, I have a very interesting, and uh, I'm honored to have uh, my guest here. This is not, um, well, his name is Bob the Builder. His first name is Bob, his middle name is The, and last name is Builder. And he's the real Bob the Builder, not that silly cartoon animation children with the song, Bob the Builders. No. So, well, Bob, thank you much for coming to um, my channel, Daniel Apologetics. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time and I look very much to speak to you. So, welcome. My pleasure. Thank you very much. So, what will you do? Uh, what will you present for us today, uh, Bob? So today, um, I thought we would go through the Dawa script, mm -hmm. and um, I, I would um, basically go through the Dawa script and, and begin the process of dismantling it. Yes, perfect. And uh, we will just uh, let you do uh, the talking for now and uh, sharpen our ears and hearts. And uh, I pray that this um, will go to open hearts, both Christians and Muslims and uh, anyone else who's watching. And uh, Take it away, Bob. Okay, uh, and and jump in is uh, uh, as and when you need to. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I I would invite people if you're a Christian to listen to this with notes and uh, use it to sort of create a skeleton by which you can then go on to do further study. And if you're a Muslim, then to consider the rubrics of the argument and to to hopefully uh, you know I would say engage with what you're hearing and not simply dismiss it. So what do I mean by a Dawa script? What I'm talking about is a series of imbibed arguments that are current and alive in Islamic culture um, that most Muslims are able to articulate to varying degrees of eloquence and accuracy with varying degrees of rhetorical flair. Now, what are the constituent parts of the Islamic Dawa script? Um, I, I, I have a, a list of 10. Uh, it's probably not a conclusive list. There's other ways that we, other arguments that we could add to it. And probably some people could think of some arguments that perhaps I've not included, but the 10 are, the Bible has been changed. We do not know who the authors of the Bible are. Therefore, the Bible is not true or trustworthy. The Trinity makes no sense. Islam is the religion of all the prophets. Christ was not crucified. Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. The Quran has been perfectly preserved. Islam is a simple monotheistic religion that is pure. Jesus Christ cannot be God and must therefore only be a prophet. Now, these arguments are given 
in in um, summary form um, and they may be articulated differently so different Muslims may put a different twist on it or different nuance or a different angle to it but these are the 10 rubrics that seem to come up again and again in conversation and I, I say again and again in conversation because it, it seems that these are arguments that I'm encountering from people regardless of wherever they're coming from. I'll attempt to give a summary form uh, dismantle to these 10 arguments. However, due to the breadth of the presentation, I'm going to lose something on debt. You, if you're, you're looking into these, to go away and do your own research around the 10 points that I'm making um, and around the 10 arguments that I'm making in response and use this presentation as a launching point for your own research. Um, and, and as I say, my, my own responses are given in brevity and thus you, you're going to have to go away and dig up some of the details um, yourself. However, I'll probably do this presentation again and again, and each time I do it, each cycle through that I do it, I'm going to be adding more detail to it. So, you know, um, look for other copies of this presentation on, on my own channel. Um, I want to encourage everyone, um, particularly my brothers and sisters who watch this, to, to get in touch with, to follow, to listen to, um, the new apologists that are emerging, people like Dr. David Wood, um, Sam Shamoon, Christian Prince, Islam Kratit, Al Fadi, Dr. J. Smith, uh, DCCI known as Defend Christianity, Critique Islam, Soko Films, which lots of people think that I am involved with, that that's my channel. That is not my channel. Um, I, it is simply a platform from which I operate. Um, and I have a close affiliation with because I helped to build the channel initially, um, but it is a separate platform uh, run by JC. We're separate in every way. Um, and then obviously myself, my brother here, um, it's Daniel Apologetics, right? Yes. Um, and, and, and use it to help to build up your knowledge base because it's only by working together that we Christians can hope to win this, um, this war of ideas um, that's occurring now on a global scale. And I think if Christians are honest, we have to admit that we're currently losing this battle. And we're not losing this battle because intellectually we're beaten. Actually, intellectually we're winning. But it's simply because there's not enough Christians who have imbibed this counter argument and have imbibed a Christian critique of Islam um, Whereas the vast majority of Muslims have imbibed some kind of critique of Christianity. So your average Muslim will be able to marshal either one to 10 of the arguments you're about to hear. And most Christians don't have a response. And that needs to change because the body of Christ is, is losing souls for no good reason at all, but just because of ignorance. So let us begin. So the first argument um, is that the Bible has been changed. And this presupposes that Christian doctrine rests upon the Bible, um, as opposed to the fact that Christian doctrine gives rise to the Bible we use. The, the preaching of the gospel is independent of scripture. So the, the preaching of the gospel happened before any of the gospels were ever written. Um, you know, so for instance, if you look at the beginning of Luke, it, it says that it's written to someone, um, Theophilus, so that he might have the certainty of that which he believes. So he already believes the gospel for which his belief is the cause of the gospel being written. The, the missing letters of Paul, for instance, Paul references in 1 Corinthians about his earlier letter. So 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. Um, the Gospel of John in its conclusion remark says that, um, you know, if, if there are many other things that our Lord did, and if they were all written down, I suppose the entire world could not hold the books that could be written. So we know that there was more that could have been written about the life of our Lord 
uh, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, uh, Daniel, but I'm getting a note up saying that your internet is unstable. So do let me know if there's any problems. Um, yeah, we'll do it. Uh, so far, uh, your sound now, is coming on really clear. Uh, sometimes you freeze a little bit, but the sound is perfect. So keep going. Okay, right. I think it's the sound that's probably more important than my yeah. ugly mug. Um, now, the, 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 the Christians use different canons of scripture and, and still do up to the present day. Um, if you think about it, the way that we Christians do evangelism in practice, you know, if we if we if you um, give a gospel presentation to someone and they're willing to accept the Lord there and then you wouldn't turn around to them and say, well, you can't become a Christian yet because you've not read the New Testament. We don't practice like a people whose religion is built on the book. We practice like a people who have a message that is contained in a book. And that, that's a really important difference. You've also got the fact that for the vast majority of Christian history, Christians never used the scriptures in the way that we do now, thanks to the modern printing press. People didn't have access to the kinds uh, to the scriptures with such ease as we do today. And thus, divine liturgies were written so that people could be introduced to the scriptures in an oral fashion. And so liturgies were filled with scriptural references, scriptural allusions, scriptural quotes. And it was by learning these liturgies that people were imbibed with the scripture. Uh, many Christians, um, and, and there's other examples like stained glass windows, for instance. Many Christians um, even today don't have a full Bible in their own language. They might only have passages or a particular book or a, a couple of books, but they don't have the entire Bible in their own language because it hasn't yet been translated. But we wouldn't turn around to these people and say that they're not Christian. The first Christians themselves didn't have access to the Bible in the same way that we did. And the very first generation of Christians um, had no access to the Bible because the apostles were still writing the scriptures. But we wouldn't say that those people weren't Christian. And so really, we've, we've got to understand that the 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 message of the Christian faith existed before the scriptures. The scriptures are poured into it and this changes the dynamics of the argument because what it essentially means is not that every single word of the bible is is significant and important in the same way that muslims view their quran but rather that the message that is contained in the scripture is what is important and the purity of that message now this changes the dynamics of the argument uh, from one of the, the idea that the Bible has been changed as being a fundamental critique to the idea that the Bible has been changed to being one of an important critique, but not fundamental. So in other words, even if the thesis was proven correct, it wouldn't be a fundamentally devastating um, argument against the Christian faith. Now, I, I don't believe that the the text of the Bible is changed to such a degree that any Christian needs to worry um, that it's just it's just uh, the evidence would seem to suggest that. Um, now, Muslims confuse questions around the canon of scripture with textual variants and these two things are not the same canon of scripture is about the number of books that we have in the bible and um, about certain questions around certain passages and textual variants are questions around um words and phrases and and, and so on and and certain passages um and so there is some overlap between questions of of canon and textual variant but they're not um they're not they're not overlapping a hundred percent and so whilst this is a, a, an important question, it's a weighty question, it is something that Christians should grapple with, our faith doesn't rest on these kinds of questions. And so we, we as Christians have got to reframe the argument and, and point out to um, our, our Muslim friends that, that actually the, the, the value that they're ascribing to the issue isn't as important as they think it is. So they often mix up questions about translation with questions of canon and questions of textual variance, as if all of these things are the same thing. 
not appreciating that they're actually different questions with some overlap, but not complete overlap. And, and that means that there's a lot of sloppy thinking going on in the argument that is being made by Muslims. But there's also a lot of ignorance on the behalf of Christians. Um, now, all of these problems are also applicable to Islamic sources. So, for instance, the, the Quran itself has textual variants. There are questions around the canonicity about hadiths, and there are variant translations of both. So if it is the case that textual variants mean that we can't trust a text, well, then we can't trust the Quran. If questions around canonicity mean that we can't trust a text, then that means we can't trust the Hadiths. And if there are question, if, if variants of translation means that we can't trust a text, then that means we can't trust the Quran or the Hadiths. But the point of the matter is, is if the if, essential, if the essential Christian message is that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. That he is the Messiah as prophesied uh, by the, the Old Testament, by the Old Testament prophets. That if he is the savior of the world, the son of the father who reveals to us the divine trinity and brings us into the worship of the one true God in spirit and truth, then what is important is whether that message is compromised. You could get rid of every Bible in the world and that message would still be being preached by the church. And so questions of textual variant are not a fundamental criticism of the Christian message. Islamic claims, furthermore, contradict their own Quran. Their own Quran testifies to the validity and the preservation of previous Christian scriptures. The Islamic logic for it to be sustained in history. So if we assumed that the Islamic polemic is true, that the Bible has been radically changed and therefore the original Islamic message has been lost from the Bible. If we pretend for a moment that that, that is a true statement then that means that we have to follow the, 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 the conclusions that flow from that premise, which is that at some point in history, it requires that someone had control over all of the texts in the entire world in such a way that they were able to change those texts to create a consistent body of of text that had a consistent message i.e that jesus did die that he did rise from the dead that he is the jewish messiah that he is the son of god that he, they controlled all of these texts and then precognitively managed to understand that we had they had to eliminate any reference to muhammad and to do that in such a way that nobody in the entire world noticed or protested or tried to preserve the originals. Now, that kind of argument is that it leads to the kind of conspiracy theory that is equal to saying that the Earth is flat and that the NASA is lying about landing on the moon. It's an incredulous argument when you think through the logic. It pushes back the point at which this could actually have happened back to the time of the writing of the original itself, because that is the only time that someone could have interfered with the text in such a way that, that all of the other things that flow out of it are true, that a consistent message is found in all of the text, and that that message was given in such a way that nobody protested or tried to preserve the original or notice the fact that there had been a change. And if we're saying that the change occurred right at the point that the original was written, then we're not talking about the original being changed. We're talking about the original being preserved. Now, the Quran itself speaks about the reality of um, the 
other texts. And I'm just going to give a whole bunch of verses. Maybe in your editing, you can stick all these verses onto the text. Yeah, we'll do. So, Surah 2, Ayah 101 and Ayah 91. Surah 4, Ayah 47 and Ayah 136. Surah 5, Ayah 68. Also, Ayah 46 to 48 and Ayah 43. Surah 10, Ayah 94. Surah 6, Ayah 114 to 115. Surah 18, Ayah 27. Surah 61, Ayah 6. Surah uh, 3, Ayah 50. Surah 3, Ayah 3 to 4. And Surah 2, 113. Now, these, when you look at them, do not support the idea of the Islamic polemic that the Bible has been so corrupted and changed that any reference to Muhammad has been eliminated and that the because um, it because it, it literally in one of them in Surah 61 6 it says it, it names Ahmed Jesus is naming Ahmed as the one that will um, um, follow him and we'll, we'll come to that later but but this the the, 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 the Quranic text doesn't support that argument um, and so if the Muslim argument is true, then the Quran is false. And Muslims are arguing something that their Quran doesn't argue. But if the Quran is right and the Bible has been preserved, then the Quran is false. And, and it doesn't matter how you play it, it still comes out that the Quran has to be false by one of these two conclusions. Because if the Bible has been changed, then there is no basis upon which we can establish that Muhammad is a prophet. Because we've got no touchstone, no reference point beyond what the Quran claims. So what's our conclusion? Christians are allowed to be at variance on these questions about canonicity and about um, our approaches to translation. And and they are at difference on those questions. But Muslims ascribe far more importance to these arguments than they actually deserve. They are important, that's undeniable, but they're not fundamentally important. The gospel would still be preached even if we banned and destroyed every Bible in the entire world. And most importantly, the gospel was preached before any letter or page of the New Testament was ever written. And so arguments about textual variance, whilst being important, are not a fundamental critique of the Christian faith. Muslims simply don't understand what we believe, and they are projecting onto our belief system things that are more properly true about their own belief system. And we'll get onto that when we talk about um, changes in the Quran. And they're just not adjusting for the difference. So that was number one. Number two, we do not know who the authors of the Bible are, and therefore we can't trust the Bible. Now, the fundamental difference between not knowing who wrote the Bible and not knowing with any empirical certainty who wrote the Bible I'll let you settle that in there on that, because Christians do certainly claim to know who the authors of the scriptures are. We say Luke wrote Luke, Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, and John wrote John, that Paul wrote his letters. So we do actually claim to know who wrote the Bible. But it's fair to say that there, there is an open debate that can be had around whether those claims can be grounded in empirical certainty. And that's fair. We, we, we can have that conversation. We can have that debate. But let's be clear, just because a question is asked, even the idea that the question can't be proven solidly empirically doesn't isn't a, a fundamental question. It's not like my faith is going to collapse if Luke didn't happen to write Luke or that Mark didn't write Mark. My faith isn't based on knowledge of the author. My base is upon whether the events described in those works are true. But think about it. 
Muslims themselves don't have an empirical certainty about the fact that the Quran was given by an angel called Gabriel. I mean, who apart from Muhammad testifies to that? Who apart from the Muhammad can claim that that's true? What evidence do we have that Muhammad got this from the angel Gabriel? We have no empirical certainty. But it doesn't stop them from saying that it came from the angel Gabriel. The church claims to know the authors of the New Testament. Furthermore, there are doubts about um, many hadiths that Muslims use. So, for instance, even in Sahih al-Bukhari, even though Imam Bukhari um, um, said that, you know, you, you, you should identify who appears in the Isnad, in some of the hadiths in Sahih al-Bukhari, where he lists the names of the people whom the hadith chain passed through to get to the present, some of those names he just lists as Muhammad in a world full of Muhammads. So who are these people? And thus, this kind of um, problem within where does this where does this chain come from who is this uh, chain, chain originating from um, draws into question whether you know using Islamic logic where whether we can trust these hadiths now knowing with empirical certainty the authorship is not as important as whether what is written is actually true or not we might know who wrote the Quran, but since it contradicts history and science, it doesn't matter that we know who wrote the Quran. The Quran is false because it contradicts history and science, especially because it claims to be free from such contradictions, which means that as well as contradicting science and history, it's self-contradictory. And so regardless of who, whether who wrote it and whether we know who wrote it, it's not trustworthy because it's false. Conversely, we might not know who wrote um, a, a particular material. The knowledge of authorship has actually no bearing at all on what is actually true and what is actually false. Anonymous works can still be true. A known authorship can still be false. But I would concede that it is a good thing to know who wrote something. I'm not denying the validity of the question. I am simply pointing out the question is not as valuable as Muslims think that it is. Christians don't need an Isnad chain for the New Testament because the Earl the, 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 the texts were written so early in church history that the church knew the authors. And so it was common knowledge amongst the uh, church um, where, who wrote what texts. And the early church, from, with, with writings of the early church fathers, um, we know that um, 22 of the books were in circulation right from the earliest times without any any issues or concerns leaving us with five texts of the new testament where their transmission for whatever reason historically was interrupted and we know that that christians were persecuted we know that christians were killed we know that christian manuscripts were taken by roman authorities and destroyed and so there's plenty of um um uh, there's plenty of historical context to allow for the interruption of the transmission of certain texts. The authorship is not, um, sorry, right, the, the, the reason why authorship was stated later is because when the common knowledge started to pass out of existence as one generation gave way to the next, the next generation started to ask the question, well, who wrote this? And so the church had to offer the answer that he had kept within its common knowledge, within its tradition. And then we, we have the authorship being ascribed at a later period. The church was teaching the doctrines of the Christian faith even before any texts were written. 
as evidenced um, by the whole of the New Testament. All of Paul's letters were written to pre-existent communities. In other words, they existed before he wrote a letter to them. All of his letters were reactionary letters by Romans and are written in such a way that they are correcting them most of the time. But if you're correcting someone, that means that there is the presence of a norm that is assumed in the correction. Luke was written for a believer. That means that there was a belief before the gospel. John was written so that people would believe. So his is a, his is a, 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 a tract, as it were, what we would call a tract. But that means that there's a body of belief before the writing. What the authors already believed um, about Jesus Christ is what Mark is defending, that Jesus Christ is the Jewish Messiah. And he's, he's giving an apologetic as to how the Jewish Messiah could suffer. That means that the belief was there before the literature. The idea of Christ being the Messiah is the apologetical theme of Matthew also. All of this testifies to the fact that the beliefs were there before the text, which means that questions of authorship, whilst being important, whilst being something that we should grapple with, and whilst being something that we can have discussions about, do not fundamentally critique the Christian faith. The question is, are the doctrines true? Was Jesus really crucified? Was he really the Messiah? That's good, Bob. Can I just uh, add one thing to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting when, you, uh, when you're talking about that, because uh, the fact is that uh, from what we know about the ancient world, about uh, Greco-Roman biographies and everything, um, virtually no, none of these has an authorship uh, dedicated to them. So uh, basically, I can only imagine, I'm sure you can as well, imagine if Christian, the Christian writings were the only one that had an authorship attached to them. I wonder how <laughs> we would surely have uh, objections as well then. Oh, look at Christianity and the uh, Christian writings. They have, uh, they have authorship next to them. But look at all the others, like the dozens and dozens of uh, Greco-Roman biographies we have that does not have authorship. So that will still make Christ Christian writings look suspicious because they will be the only one with an authorship on while all the others virtually don't have. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we don't, we don't have, we don't, we, you know, th there's countless scripts that have passed over it from antiquity where they don't have a signed name at the bottom because it just wasn't normative. And, and Dr. Mike Lacona has done great work to establish that the literature of the New Testament sits in the norms of its time. And so it, it's almost an, an ahistorical argument to demand the kind of um, evidenced authorship that we would expect in the 21st century, you know? Yeah. Um, but as I say, it's not, it, it even, it, 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 whilst it is an interesting question, whilst it is an important question, it's not as fundamental as Muslims think that it is. And once again, it's a, a, a question of something that would be a fundamental critique to Islam. They are simply applying it to Christianity without any adjustment for the difference. So it is a fundamental critique to the hadiths of Islam if we don't know where those hadiths come from. And that's why Muslims obsess about it. But as, and I'm, I'm starting to dig into it, you know, I'm just starting to investigate this. But, you know, as Hatun Tash and Dr. Jay Smith and Dr. Uh, Daniel Brubaker and Dr. Um, Keithy Small have destroyed the idea of the perfect Quran, well, soon we're going to see the idea that the hadiths themselves can be trusted is going to be destroyed. You know, that the pillars of Islam are, are, are shaking. Yeah. Anyway, pressing on. Yep. The idea that the Trinity makes no sense. Um, 
Now, this is a separate question from the idea that the Trinity is not taught in the Bible. And I've done lots of programs on my show showing that the Trinity is in the Bible. I've had multiple debates. You've probably seen them yourself, yeah. Daniel, um, showing that the Trinity is in the Bible. So I'm, I'm not going to focus in on that. And if anybody wants to see those, they can just jump on. Oh, yeah, there are plenty of so cool. resources to uh, look so in cool. for that. Yeah, so I'm just going to look at the sort of logical point of it, because the argument is that the Trinity makes no sense. How can three be one and one be three? I mean, this kind of objection, though, is ridiculous. And it's ridiculous precisely because Muslims believe this, that it makes no sense. They believe it only because they tell themselves that it makes no sense. It's like a mantra, because in my experience, the moment you stop talking about, you stop putting the word Trinity in there and you stop saying Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and you talk about other examples of plurality and singularity in coexistence, uh, Muslims have no objection. They get it. They understand it without any problems at all, which demonstrates that the issue is not whether the Trinity makes sense, but it's the mantra that Muslims tell themselves that it doesn't make sense. So let me give you three examples. Let me give you a couple of examples that demonstrate the idea of plurality and singularity. So you've got three dimensional space, you've got the horizontal, you've got the X axis, the Y axis and the Z axis. We sit in three dimensional space right now. We experience it as a singularity. We have no problem making the distinctions between the X, Y and Z axis. We accept that there are distinctions and we also accept that each dimension of three dimensional space has all the properties of the other two dimensions and that they are all essentially the same thing. They get it. You get it. Why can't you get it about the Trinity? Um, the triple point of water. You can look this up on YouTube. It's a, it's a fan, fascinating thing to watch. I actually, ha I actually have a video on that. It's called Three Minutes on the Trinity. And I'm actually showing uh, the experiment while it's going on. Uh, so you can, I will link that. Uh, I'll show yeah, that yeah. Here. please yeah. stick it in mm -hmm. the box for people mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. Because the triple point of water is a, a, a physical demonstration of a trinity. Uh, the, the same substance demonstrate in the properties of solid, liquid and gaseous at exactly the same moment in time. But you wouldn't turn around and say that, well, those are three substances just because they're demonstrating three properties. You would say that they're the same thing. If I take the water that I've got in this bottle and I pour it into three cups, do I have one drink or do I have three drinks? I have three drinks in so far as it's in cups. I have one drink in so far as it's the same drink in each one, H2O. It has the same properties. All of the cups will make me wet in the same way. All of the cups will have the same temperature. All of the cups will behave the same way if I boil them. All of the cups will behave the same way if I stick them in the freezer. All of the cups will quench my thirst. So. The fact that they're in three cups doesn't make them three different drinks. Muslims get that. Why can't they get it about the Trinity? Um, the idea that H2O can exist in three states, which is a, an extension of the parallel of the triple point of water, you know, ice, solid and gaseous. Infinity plus infinity plus infinity equals what, Daniel? Infinity. Exactly. So, you know, mathematically, it makes sense. One times one times one equals what? One. One. So even mathematically, it makes sense. The idea of a triangle, not necessarily the best example, but it's an example of a, a singularity with plurality. So Muslims get the idea of singularity and plurality without any problem at all. They're not stupid but they have this mantra in their head that they just repeat without thinking, which is that the Trinity doesn't make sense. And that is what stops them from understanding the Trinity. The moment they stop saying that silliness to themselves, then they will be able to understand the Trinity. 
it's not just and, and and singularities with plurality are not just limited to the number three either there's m a myriad of examples of all kinds of combinations of singularities and pluralities existing together the example of the human body it's a composite it's called an organism it's because it's got multiple organs that are all together a plant light there's many examples of plurality and singularity if Muslims can accept these things or pluralities within singularities, then they should have no logical grounds to object to the idea of a multiplicity within the singularity of the divine Godhead as being illogical. They don't have those grounds. All they have is a mantra and they just need to grow up and stop talking like children. Christians believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit whilst being co-relational to one another and thus distinct from one another, have at exactly the same moment, without any partition, the exact same essence, substance. The thing that makes them God is identical to all of the persons, as it is of the Father that the Son is begotten, and it is of the Spirit that the sorry and it is of the father that the spirit proceeds and thus the divinity in each of the persons is identical but it gets worse and we'll dig into this a bit more later on which is that you know if muslims are accusing our belief to be illogical well islamic monotheism itself is full of inconsistencies muslims claim that allah is a singularity a monad well, if he is a singularity without any plurality, why does he have 99 attributes? If Allah is a monad, a singularity without any plurality, how can he be described with having distinguishable body parts? If Allah is a monad, a truly unique singularity without any plurality, how can we speak of him in any meaningful way at all? You see, if Allah is so other to his creation, what does it even mean to say that Allah is merciful or that Allah is the first or the last or to say that Allah is the light or to say that Allah is any of the descriptions that are given to him? Because if there is no touchstone, no connection point between our language about God and God himself, because he is completely other to his creation, then all of these words just disappear into babble they just disappear into meaninglessness because there's no connection between the words and the reality that they're describing we christians don't have this problem because we have the imatio deo the image of god with which we are made which is one touchstone and we have the incarnation of our lord jesus christ which is another touchstone which means that when we speak of these kinds of words we are describing something that has a connection but muslims don't have that if they are true to their idea that Allah is a monad uh, and a truly unique singularity without any kind of plurality. Now, if all the texts of like the Quran and the Hadiths suggest that there is a plurality within the divinity of Allah, then it is it's fair of us to conclude that indeed there is a plurality within the divinity of Allah and that the rhetoric made by Muslims is simply a false one. And thus, if there can be a plurality within the singularity of Allah, why can't there be a plurality within the singularity of Yahweh? Why, why is it good for them but not good for us? So we conclude, therefore, that the Christian of God is far more rational and consistent than the Islamic view of Allah. Our theology of God is found in our scriptures plainly. But the Islamic theology contradicts directly the plain reading of their texts. They have to take this so-called clear guidance that was given perfectly in Arabic and make the text say something that the text doesn't say so that it fits their theology, which demonstrates that their theology came after their text, not from their text. Argument number four. Ready? Am oh, I okay to go yeah, on? Yeah, just one little thing there. Um, this is also very interesting what you're saying because 
you know, if you take time, space, and matter, we have time. Then we have past, present, future. That's a little trinity right there. Then we have yep, space. That's another example yeah, of a trinity. We have space. Uh, uh, we have length, width, and height. That's three other things. Yep. And that's then, right, and, and, then and then matter, solid, liquid, gas. So the trinity is all around us, and you can have you can have trinity in the, in you can be you, like you can have one uh, one what and three who's. Uh, it's it, it's possible. Exactly. It's 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 it, it, it's not a we Christians genuinely don't have a rational problem. What we have is an educational problem within the church in that there are too many Christians that are not taught how to defend the Trinity. And we need to learn how to defend the Trinity. Mm. And that starts with a, an accurate understanding of the Trinity. And it starts with a confidence in its rationality. And, and, and the thing is, you know, as someone who studied Islam, trust me, their, their religion isn't as simple as they think it is. Their understanding of God is not as plain or as simple as they say that it is. And we'll come on to some other um, touch points on that um, shortly. So am I all right to move on? Yeah, go ahead. Well done. Keep Any going. questions on anything you've heard nothing, so far from nothing. one to four? Nothing. I, um, you covered okay. it very well, right. so keep going. Okay. So the idea that all the prophets taught Islam. Um, Muslims argue, marshal this argument incredibly spuriously and it's based on the 99-1 logic that David Wood articulates in Act 17 apologetics which is that if a Muslim apologist says something 99 people will just go oh wow that was amazing and take it on board and only one of the 99 will actually bother to go out and do any checking of any kind at all and 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 you find a lot of that with they redact islam simply to believing how's my connection doing uh you're frozen and can you I've take a note it can, here can, saying that the connection's unstable uh, okay uh, yeah i'm okay can you go, go back to uh, just after what you said about 99 yeah, what was one? the last thing you heard 99 one rule after you finish that okay yeah 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 so the muslims redact islam to simply believing in one God and a prophet. And that's not Islam. It is not Islam to believe in one God and a prophet. Islam is more than that. But they reduce Islam to that level so that they can expand the boundaries of what it means to be a Muslim to include people who would never be included in the fold of Islam today if they were alive today. If Abraham was alive today and Moses was alive today and David was alive today, Muslims would be trying to convert them because they don't follow Islam. If Islam, um, Islam, if it has survived into the present, um, Islam, as it has survived into the present, is much larger than simply a belief in one God and a belief in a prophet. Um, it's a socio-economic and political matrix that would exclude all of the previous prophets. It is essentially a form of sophism, uh, a word play that's jumping around on the meaning of words to create a spurious connection to massage the boundaries so that previous prophets that aren't Muslims at all can be included and it's based upon an incredibly um, selective use of evidence that's often taken if not wholly and completely taken out of context the fact that muslims do this redaction is because it is the only way they can fit islam into the past and thus they identify anyone who believes such things um in our in our scriptures like Jesus, our Lord, is a Muslim. And they try to shoehorn Islam into past figures. So they'll quote a verse that says Jesus believed in one God and then go, he's a Muslim. Well, Jesus also believed in the temple. Jesus also believed in the priesthood. Jesus also believed in the Sabbath. And we don't have any of those in Islam today. 
So Jesus wasn't a Muslim. Jesus prayed standing up, looking towards heaven. Muslims are forbidden to look towards heaven when they pray. Jesus called God his father. Muhammad doesn't. And so Jesus isn't a Muslim. But Muslims say that you believe in one God and a prophet and therefore you're a Muslim. Well, by that logic, I can say I'm a Muslim because I believe in one God and I believe in the prophet Moses. So therefore I'm a Muslim. But no one would call me a Muslim. Do you know why? Because I'm not. And belief in one God and a prophet is not sufficient. However, if you make every named prophet, i.e. all of the ones of the Old Testament, a Muslim who believes in one God and those that follow that prophet Muslims, then we need to look at the God that they believed in. So let's look at the God that David believed in and the God that Moses believed in and the God that Abraham believed in and the God that our Lord Jesus Christ believes in, his father, and see if they're different to Allah. Well, they have different names for one. That's quite important. If I called you Brett, you would wonder who I'm talking to because your name isn't Brett. Um, one can what the, the, the God of the Judeo-Christian faith can enter into his creation. The God of Muhammad can't. The God of the Judeo-Christian faith establishes covenants leading to the coming savior. Islam, the God of Muhammad didn't. The God of um, Abraham to Jesus has a plurality within him. The, the God of Muhammad apparently doesn't. The God of the Old Testament and our Lord Jesus Christ established Sabbaths, a temple, a tabernacle where his presence would be on earth, a sacrificial system, a priesthood, kings and a kingdom and a kingship. He talked about a Messiah who would be a priest and a king, who would be a sacrifice who would be the savior of the world. The God of Muhammad never teaches such things. The moral character of these gods are different. One upholds his moral law as eternal. The other breaks those very same laws and allows Muhammad to do so. One of those gods values power and domination as the highest possible value. The other value service and redemption as the highest possible values these are not the same gods and so it isn't sufficient to say that to believe in one god well what does that god look like in conclusion the named prophets of the old testament believed in a very different god to that found in the quran and there is zero evidence at all for us to support the argument that Islam existed before the time of Muhammad. It is a con an Islamic conspiracy that, that on, the, on the basis of the Quran to claim that Islam existed before Muhammad, for which there is zero evidence. Like it, it's like saying that NASA never went to the moon or that, you know, we've never been into space. It's conspiracy level kind of stuff to say that Islam existed before Muhammad. And it's based on zero evidence. It's just based upon extremely selective evidence, the kind of use of evidence that David Icke would be proud of. The term Islam and Muslim are massaged and expanded to include people that if they were alive today would never be seen as Muslims. And that makes the term meaningless. Like I said, if being a Muslim means you submit to one God, then I am a Muslim. So there you go, guys. You should love me as a Muslim. But you don't do that. And you don't do that because that isn't sufficient. Any questions on that before we move on to point number five? No, no, not really. Just that, uh, you know, it, it really makes you think that uh, the Muslims, they are really following uh, a, a claim. You know, this is it's, it's just Muhammad who took a claim from uh, from uh, the cave and then uh, it, it took it from there. I mean, you wouldn't do that today. Uh, or uh, I, I just, it's just quite quite incredible that uh, one claim alone from a guy in the cave can mm. can result in this, you know? Yep. 
it's, you it's see, quite the, different. The, the, the Christian faith is is the working of God in history over mm. thousands of years with the people Israel. Mm. You know, and 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 the fact that the Israelites are here today and that they are a blessing to all the nations of the world through their genius. You know, that God took these savages, these mm. brutalized slaves from Egypt and over the centuries, over the millennia, turned them into the genius that they are today, from which we have all received their blessings. Just as the Bible prophesied that he would thousands of years ago to Abraham is a demonstration that we are not just following the, the babblings of, of cave dwelling prophets. But Islam comes out of the blue, uh, contradicts everything that comes before it, and has no validating proofs. And the only argument that Muslims can marshal is, well, Islam dominates. Well, you know, so did Napoleon. So did um, the USSR. So does the United States today. The fact that you have the biggest guns and the biggest armies and you've conquered the most lands doesn't mean that all your values and your doctrines are therefore true. It's a false logic. Anyway, moving on yeah. to point number five, that Christ was not crucified. And this is the thing for me that, that so easily disproves Islam. You're looking tired. Are you all right? No, I'm, I'm fine. It's Am just I good to this... press on? No, this this um, this uh, argument that you're going into now, the whole thing denying of Jesus' crucifixion is just outstandingly crazy for me because it's the most historical event that we know. If you this, if you basically, if you uh, if you don't acknowledge the crucifixion, you you might as well just throw out all history. Yeah, uh, we're we'll, we're going to come to that yeah. exactly. Keep going. So Muslims claim that Christ Jesus was not crucified, and the Quran. And, and then they go on to say that, you know, that Christians are in doubt and confused about what really happened. And they're doing this because they're directly echoing the claims that the Quran make. But let's be clear, there is zero evidence of Christians being in any doubt about whether Christ was crucified. If anything, it is a 100% certain that all Christians everywhere have believed that Christ was crucified crucified in fact it's such an essential part of what it means to be a christian that anyone who says any different is immediately disqualified from the title christian in the same way that any muslim who says that muhammad wasn't a prophet can't be a muslim you have to believe that christ was crucified to be a christian and there's no doubt and no confusion so the quran's claims are simply false we're not in any doubt and we're not in any dispute Actually, it's the case that modern Muslims have had to reinvent their position within the last hundred years in the light of the overwhelming evidence that has been marshaled to demonstrate that Christ was crucified. Classical medieval Muslims used to say that Christ was never crucified and that someone else was crucified in his place. Now, Muslims argue that Christ um, was nailed to a cross, but he didn't die on a cross and therefore he wasn't crucified because he didn't die. Now, that tells me that actually the only people that are in doubt and conjecturing about what actually happened 2000 years ago are Muslims, not Christians. And Muslims disagree about who supposedly replaced him on the cross. They have no certainty about their beliefs, and it's a case of them projecting onto us something that's actually true about them. Muslims argue that early heretical movements did not believe in Christ's crucifixion. However, that is completely false. Even the early heresies believed in the crucifixion. The Docetists believed in the crucifixion. They argued, though, that Christ was simply presenting himself as being crucified as an illusion, as, as one who was crucified. But he wasn't actually crucified because he wasn't really human. He was actually God, which incidentally means that the earliest Christian heresies were also affirming the deity of Christ. The Ebionites believed in the crucifixion 
whilst denying that Christ was truly divine. The Arians believed in the crucifixion whilst denying that he was eternally divine. The Nestorians believed in the crucifixion whilst denying he was fully human. The modalists believed in the crucifixion whilst denying that he was one of the three divine persons of the Godhead. The Gnostics believed in the crucifixion whilst denying monotheism. The Jews believed that Christ was crucified, but they assumed that he was an accursed blasphemer and not the Messiah. And lastly, the early Christians believed in the crucifixion whilst upholding the fullness of the Christian faith. All of the groups of antiquity believed that Christ was crucified. It's a fact. And if we don't accept that fact, then we can't know anything about history at all, because if this is the most solid fact in history, because everyone agrees that it happened. And they have their own interpretations of why it happened. The gospel accounts are very clear that Christ was crucified and they urge belief in Jesus. Pagan historians are quite clear that Christ was crucified whilst not believing in Jesus at all. Jewish historians were quite clear that Christ was crucified whilst not believing in Jesus. So this is not a disputable point. But if it's true that Christ was crucified, then the Quran contradicts history and therefore is false. Therefore, since all these groups and sources agree that Christ was crucified, we can be certain that Christ was crucified. The weight of all history is firmly and convincingly on the side of the church, as is pretty much the entirety of any genuine scholarship on this question. Now, Muslims love quoting Dr. Bart Ehrman. So I thought I would quote Dr. Bart Ehrman on the question of the crucifixion. The words of Dr. Bart Ehrman, quote, The crucifixion of Jesus by the Romans is one of the most secure facts we have about his life. Whenever anyone writes a book about the historical Jesus, it is really, really, really important to see if what they say about his public ministry can make sense of his death. If not, then you have a problem. For example, if Jesus is best understood principally as a great rabbi who taught his followers they should love one another and even love their enemies, why would the Romans execute him? Oh no, we can't have you loving us. To the cross with you. Or if you were a Jewish cynic philosopher who taught his followers not to be invested in the material things of this world, but to share what they have and be concerned only with spiritual things, what would make that a capital offense? How many cynics were crucified? Or if Jesus were principally interested in equality for women? or in having his followers adopt a proto-Marxist principles, or whatever, why was he killed? If a scholar tries to explain Jesus's life in a way that really doesn't make much sense of his death, then that should be the first clue that something is amiss. So Dr. Bart Ehrman basically said that you assess the value of any scholar's scholarship about Jesus from the perspective of his death, which means that Bart Ehrman is very clear, Jesus died. And if you can't explain why he was put to death, why he was executed, then you don't understand the life of Jesus. If Christ just taught Judaism, why crucify him? If he taught a belief in one God, why crucify him? There's something else about Jesus. There's something particular about 
the claims that Jesus was making, which go beyond monotheism, that go beyond the law of Moses, that leads to his execution. And that means that the view that Muslims have about Jesus doesn't make sense of his death, which, according to Bart Ehrman, should be the first clue that something is amiss. In other words, Muhammad got it wrong. Conclusion. Christ was indeed crucified and was crucified because he saw himself as more than a prophet teaching monotheism as more than someone who was following the laws of Moses, because after all, there were lots of Jews following the laws of Moses at the time of Jesus, and they were not crucified. He understood himself in such a way that he upset the Jews of his own time, who were so enraged by his claims that they forced the hands of the Romans to permit his crucifixion. That means that those claims were not simply believe in one God and follow the laws of Moses. Because after all, every Jew was already doing that. It means that he had to say something that that so inflamed the passions of the Jews that they would want to see him dead. Now, pray tell me, Daniel, what could that be? Oh, I don't know, something like uh, I am, for example, or uh, for Abraham was, I am. Exactly, something like I am God, I am Yahweh on earth. Or something like you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Many examples can be given, really. Exactly. He taught a divinity of his own self. And that is in error and wrong. And since the Quran claims not to be in error and not to be wrong, it's not true. Any questions on that before we move on? No, keep going. We're doing well. Okay. Yeah. Now, the first thing that every Christian should do is to refuse any and any and, and, and Muslims use lots of different passages all the way through the Old Testament mainly through the Old Testament. They've actually stopped using the New Testament, in my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, though there's, there's a couple of passages that some, some people who haven't caught up with apologetics still try to use. But the first thing that a Christian should do in response to this is not to entertain a prophecy about Muhammad that is not in the first five books of the Bible, the Psalms, or the Gospels. Because the Quran only claims that Muhammad can be found in the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil, which means that any use of Isaiah demonstrating that Muslims don't actually care about what the Quran says. Because the Quran doesn't reference Isaiah as a place where Muhammad is prophesied. It doesn't mention the songs of songs as a place where Muhammad is prophesied. I've got uh, your internet connection is unstable. Am I still coming through clearly? Yeah, coming through clearly. But uh, as, as mentioned before, sometimes you freeze, but the, the audio Hello. is great. The audio is great. I can hear you very well. Yep, but the audio is great. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, the, you know, the Song of Songs is, is not mentioned. The Book of Isaiah is not mentioned. So why are Muslims going to these places to try and prove Muhammad? It means that they don't actually take their own Quran seriously because the Quran doesn't give them license to do that. What it demonstrates is that Muslims who are doing Noah don't care about consistency. They don't care about truth. All they care about is winning. And the church needs to wake up to that because that's the kind of your opponent you're facing. You're facing an opponent that is wanting to win at any cost, even at the cost of consistency. They don't care. They just want to win. And you have to be aware of that and you have to rise to the occasion. Now, the Injil itself, sorry. um, Yeah. So they're going beyond the boundaries of their own um, Quran and they're just making up arguments ad hoc. And that demonstrates itself that their position is weak that they're having to invent non-Quranic arguments. The Injil in the Quran itself is supposedly very explicitly stating that Ahmed, not Muhammad, 
is the one that is prophesied to come. Now, names matter. If it didn't matter, then I could say the Shahada without saying Muhammad's name. I could just say Ahmed instead of Muhammad. But that's not a proper Shahada. That's not acceptable. If names don't matter, I can say Yahweh. So I could use Yahweh instead of Allah, and I can use Ahmed instead of Muhammad, and then I can say I'm a Muslim. It's not acceptable. Names matter. And if it matters enough in the Quran for the Quran to be explicit that Ahmed is the one to come, then I am legitimate in asking for Muslims to show me where Ahmed is found in the New Testament. And they can't show me. Muslim pol polemicists like Ahmed Iddat are again following the 99-1 rule. Zakia Naik is following the 99-1 rule. Shabia Ali is following the 99-1 rule. Shabia Ali does it with a, a finesse and a sophistication, but his argumentation is no better. Um, when they, they, they are just essentially lying. Um, when they talk about Ahmed being in the New Testament or using um, Isaiah or the Song of Solomon and saying that Muhammadin is a reference to Muhammad. It's a Hebrew adjective and it's used in other places in the Old Testament that are connected to Muhammadin's destruction. The thing that is described as Muhammadin is destroyed. So does that, if we apply Muslims logic, then that means God is destroying Muhammad. But Muslims don't want to apply that logic wherever it's inconvenient. Muhammadin is a word that sounds similar to Muhammad, but it's not the same word. It's like saying Amiga in Spanish and Amiga in English. One is referring to a computer and the other one is referring to my girlfriend or, or my friend who is a girl. They're the same word, but they're not the same word. Um, and so again, it demonstrates that the weakness of these kinds of arguments demonstrates that Muslims are aware at an unconscious level that the Quran is in trouble and they're trying to bail out the Quran from that trouble. And they're doing so because the Quran claims that we should be able to find Muhammad in the Torah, the Zabur and the Injil and we can't and therefore the Quran is making a false claim. And so Muslims are throwing the kitchen sink at the idea of trying to save the Quran. Two texts that they often use are John 16, 13 and Deuteronomy 18, 15. So, you know, in, Deuter in John, the, the, the passage in John 16 to 13 is part of a monologue that our, our Lord is giving that starts back in John 14 to 16. And if you just read it carefully, you, it's very plain that the one that is coming can't be Muhammad. For, for lots of the reasons um, that are given. Um, the, the passage, in, and, I've, and I've done debates and discussions on that uh, at various times in, in my videos. Um, in Deuteronomy 18.15, it talks about a, a prophet who is coming from amongst their brethren. Um, but in Deuteronomy 17.15, it, it uses exactly the same Hebrews to talking about a king who will be brought up from amongst their brethren. And, and it's so it's exactly the same construct, it's exactly the same words, and it's speaking about a king being placed over Israel. The, the Jews didn't understand that as going to find an Arab and they're making them the king over them. They understood that as establishing a Jew as a king over them. And that's what they did. And, and so the, the idea that it's from amongst their brethren is a reference to Arabs is is. It's based upon it's based upon massaging what that word means. Because that word and that construct is used in other passages as clearly referring to from amongst the Israelites, from amongst the Israelite people. And and I did a presentation on my video, I need to probably do it again in more detail, um, where I list um, all the comparators between our Lord Jesus Christ and Moses. Because this, this passage in, in Deuteronomy is like a prophet, like unto Moses from amongst your brethren. And I think I stopped after 30, not because I had run out of comparisons, but because I thought, well, 30 kind of makes my point. 
Yeah. You know, if I can find 30 points of comparison between Jesus and Muhammad, uh, sorry, Jesus and Moses, and, and some of these points are really fundamental, like both Jesus and Moses spoke to God face to face. Muhammad never did. Both Jesus and God came in the name of Yahweh. In fact, Yeshua means Yahweh saves. Muhammad, the, the name Yahweh is foreign to Muhammad. And, and, and there's countless other examples, countless other um, comparators. You know, um, both Muhammad, uh, sorry, not Muhammad, both Moses and Jesus believed in the priesthood of Israel. Um, both of them kept the law of Moses. Muhammad never kept the law of Moses. You know, and, 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 broke all ten. You broke all ten. Well, yeah. he broke more than all ten. Yeah. You know, um, he, he ate camel meat. Camel meat's forbidden in the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and there's countless other examples. I'm not going to go into them, but there is an extensive video on Soko Films where I make the argument and I give 30, 30 points on that. Good. So, conclusion. The Quran claims that Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. The Bible contains no prophecies of Muhammad. Therefore, the Quran is in error. It is false. However, the scriptures do warn us to be aware of false teachers and says that um, accursed are those who preach a gospel different to the one given by the apostles. Um, therefore, we must see Muhammad in this light. He is a false teacher who is accursed. And that is the proper Christian view of Muhammad. And it is the only view that is apostolic and orthodox. Any view that massages on that, like the, um, you know, like the massaging that's done by um, um, Hans Kung, for instance, um, whose book I have up there, you know, it is an unorthodox view of Muhammad. And it's done for political reasons um, of modern politics rather than any uh, adherence to orthodox teaching. Um, yeah, I do suggest you go and watch that video. Maybe chase me up for the link and I'll send it to you. Yeah. Uh, where I talk about the 30 points of reference between our Lord and the prophet Moses. Yeah, that's good. Also, so, any the, questions? The, any questions on that? Well, not not really question. Just uh, it's not so long ago since um, David. Go on, Wood, I'm listening. Uh, yeah, it's not so long ago since David Wood, Sam Shamoon, and the apostate prophet they went through uh, the Ten Commandments and uh, and showed basically uh, how Muhammad broke all ten of them. So, yeah, do check that out as well, uh, any viewers. Uh, it's uh, quite interesting. Yep, definitely. Hmm. The, 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 it's a staggering level of, um, just want to see if maybe I've got it here to maybe run through it quickly. Mm -hmm. Some of the points of reference. Um, I don't have it to hand. It would appear not. I probably got it somewhere, but you have that in a written format? Like, uh, uh, for, online? yeah, I have it. I have notes that I use to give the talk. Um, but uh, I can't get them. I, if I'd if I'd planned a little bit more, and I apologise for this, I, I could oh, have had worry. it and and gone through it in a bit more detail. But what I'll do is I'll maybe do a Q and A on my own channel at some point, and then if you guys want to talk to me about it, um, yeah, actually, it would be quite nice uh, after you have this presentation that we do uh, another week, uh, like a follow up with uh, questions and answers. Uh, uh, that is, uh, we can merge together with this one, like a follow up. Yeah. yeah, and why not? So just uh, uh, keep, keep going with the presentation. No. It's good stuff. Okay, I, I, I will do. No, no, I, I don't have it to hand. Uh, I've got it somewhere. Next time. Uh, I apologize about that. That's uh, that's poor on my part. Don't worry about uh, it. Next foolish. time. Next time. Next yep. time. No, uh, that'll, that'll bug me now. Um, <laughs> anyway, so the idea that the Quran is perfectly preserved. Now, this is a staggering failure of logic by Muslims to conclude that preservation proves the divine origin. I mean, that's just nonsense. Uh, there's many books that are preserved. Um, one doesn't logically, one, one premise doesn't logically lead to the other conclusion. 
just because something is preserved doesn't mean that it's divine in origin that, that's just ridiculous logic and the evidence doesn't even support the assertion. So the evidence on the ground, when we actually look at lots of different Qurans, doesn't support the idea that all Quran that the Quran has been preserved. Not perfectly, anyway. It has been preserved. I, I concede the Quran has been preserved, but it hasn't been perfectly preserved. And there is a world of difference between preserved and perfectly preserved. Um, now. Uh, this is actually an interesting point because it's, it's a testable claim. To claim that the Quran has been perfectly preserved can be tested in a rigorously scientific way through falsification. Now, you can't positively prove that every Quran has, you can't positively prove that the Quran has been perfectly preserved because that would mean that you would have to compare every single Quran in the entire world to see if they're identical. You can't do that. It's beyond scope. But you can assert the claim that the Quran has never been changed, and then you can try to falsify the claim through a negation, through evidence that there are actual evidences that it has been changed. And then when that evidence mounts up, you can claim that, the, that you can you can demonstrate that the claim has been falsified. So this actually is very open to rigorous scientific um, testing. Mm -hmm because it, it just happens hap happily to be one of those claims that we can falsify. And how would you go about falsifying it? Well, you would you would go and look, go and compare different Qurans. And you would see if they're all the same. And you would note down the differences. It's not hard. And people are doing it. Mm -hmm. And they are finding that it's been changed. Um, but it's not just there. The Hadiths themselves evidence that the Quran has been changed, that, that, that what was understood at the time of Muhammad, let's just assume that the hadiths are true and reliable for a moment. What was understood at the time of Muhammad to be the Quran was much larger than what we find in it today. And the hadiths demonstrate that. They demonstrate that surahs were larger than they are today that there are verses that were around at the time of Muhammad that we don't have today. So one example of that is stoning, which the Hadith state was clearly there at the time of Muhammad and Muhammad used to stone people for adultery. And, and you know, that, that that verse is now not in the Quran and therefore, you know, Muslims are worried that people will not do, will not do something that Muhammad himself commanded his followers to do in the Quran and did himself. And, and it's, it's a really interesting one, this one, because to me, this is an evidence of a hadith being made up and then considered sahih by Muslims to accommodate for the fact that Muslims liked a particular practice that they couldn't justify from the Quran. So they got a get around by creating a hadith that said that the verse used to exist, but now weren't missing. Um, and, and, you know, th th there's, there's evidence that Muslims disagreed about how the Quran should be recited, um, that they were falling out with one another about this. Th there's inconsistencies in the story of how the Quran came to come about, different stories about how the Quran came to be in its present form, which Muslims obviously synergize in the same way that we do with the Quartet Gospel and the, the sort of narrative differences in the Quartet Gospel. But, but the thing is, Muslims don't have a concept of a Quartet Gospel. We have a concept of a Quartet Gospel. Muslims have this belief that their hadiths are reliable stories, but these reliable stories are contradicting one another about how the Quran came into its present shape. Now, when they find contradictions in the Bible, they say that that's evidence that it's not true and not trustworthy and not reliable. Well, why don't they do the same about their hadiths? And if they're going to do the same about their hadiths, they don't know how the Quran got to them today. Now, um, it's not just uh, looking, I mean, there's just direct evidence that the Quran has been manip a manipulated text. So Dr. Daniel Brubaker on his, his YouTube channel, um, stop me if there's any problems uh, good. because I'm seeing internet problems. Um, doc yeah, Dr. Daniel Brubaker on his YouTube channel um, is looking at consonantal variants of the earliest Quran's 
copies that we have. And and he's he's noting down on his YouTube channel all the textual variants mm -hmm. of the earliest Quran. And it's clearly demonstrating that at a later stage, a hand was put onto these Qurans to make them to make them conform to a particular Quranic form. It was a revision of their Qurans. It was a standardization of their Qurans. I think the most likely is contender was probably the Ottoman Empire because the variants um, were the variants um, were um, in line with the halves and also the, uh, the the Ottomans were the people I think that had the most chance opportunity to to manipulate all of these texts mm. um, so but it's not just Dr. Daniel Brubaker it's Dr. Keithy Small. Um, who's written on textual variants connected to the Sana uh, pamphlet sets and manuscripts. With these were a whole corpus of texts that were found in Sana in, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and, and he notes textual variants there. Dr. J. Smith and Hatun Tash of DCCI have dug into the textual variants of the Kirat, which is this this reinvention of of islam uh, for those of you that don't know um when i used to when i was thinking about becoming a muslim a long time ago mm -hmm. i used to go to the mosque and i was told that all qurans in the world were the same dot for dot letter for letter word for word i've read this in islamic pamphlets i can still find pamphlets that make this argument i i've heard muslims argue it um and the fact of the matter is right before our eyes right now in front of the entire world muslims are changing their argument they've gone from saying every single quran in the entire world is identical to there's one quran in seven forms you know what it means to say that there's one quran in seven forms it means you've got seven qurans that's what you're really saying so which Quran came from Muhammad? Now, um, um, these kinds of changes, um, uh, sorry, I mean, ha, the, the, the question that I would leave to Muslims is how many, how many kinds of changes do we have to evidence to you before you just accept the obvious? Your Quran has been changed. Now, I, I want to concede some things because I think that, that we, need to, we need to be honest in this debate and we need to be honest in this discussion. These textual variants don't undermine any other fundamental doctrine of Islam except for one, which is that the Quran has been perfectly preserved. That is the only doctrine of Islam that is compromised by this evidence. The essential message of the Quran is the same. It is not affected. But, but, but let's be clear. Who, who else do you hear making that kind of argument? It's the Christians. So now the Islamic word of God is no better than the Bible. But the Bible's been corrupted and lost. So why can't we say that about the Quran? If you want to use our defense, then you have to use our conclusions. If you want to use our defense, you have to use our conclusions. And our conclusion is that the Bible is not literally imposed word for word by God. That's not what we believe. Which means that you now have to say the same about the Quran. Because if the text of the Quran is not preserved, then which words are from God and which words are from men? We Christians don't have that problem because we say all of the words are from men. The men were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write in their words what God was doing in history, what was important to God and what we should believe about God. Yeah. So we don't have that problem that Muslims have. These textual variants, as I say, um, only comprise um, one point. The, the Christian message of Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, Christ returning is something that we have preached for 2000 years that message has not changed 
our views that it is the message, not the Bible, the words of the Bible that are important, is what's important to us. So our faith is unaffected. But how does Islam stand when they have to start doing textual criticism of their changed texts? And so I invite Muslims on that ground alone to embrace Christ as their king, their Lord, their savior and their brother. Any questions on that argument before we move on? No, uh, nothing. That was, uh, was really good. Keep going. Okay, so we're, we're coming up to half past eight and mm -hmm. we said we were going to do this for two hours. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much of, I'm not sure I'm going to get all the way through the 10. Well, are you so now, what I might uh, suggest no, 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 is that num we do an, another set. Um, mm -hmm. Number uh, eight, was it? We, we, that, that maybe we do like a mop-up session and then you can just edit the two things together. Yeah, yeah, that that we can that we can do too. It's, it's no problem. If not, um, okay, I can I can yeah do split into five and five as well. Um, and yeah, yeah, mm. I'll, I'll I'll press on because I, I said we go until nine. So let's press on until nine. Yeah, keep going. The next argument is that Christianity is immoral due to the things that that Christians Christi that Christians permit, like alcohol and sex mm. outside of marriage or sexual promiscuity right uh, let, let, let's just be logical for a second there are good christians and there are bad christians and most christians slide across that spectrum of being a good christian or a bad christian at different parts in their life i know i do i've sinned in my life i've not always been a good christian and there are areas in my life where i still could be a better christian than i am there are areas in my life where i'm still prone to sin so don't anyone stick me on any kind of um, pedestal. Um, but there are good mus there, there are good Christians and there are bad Christians, just like there are good Muslims and there are bad Muslims. Should we therefore judge Islam by all of its bad Muslims? If it's not right to judge Islam by all of its bad Muslims, then it's not right to judge Christianity by all of its bad Christians. So this argument is immediately debunked because saying that Christianity is immoral because of immoral Christians, then it is a flawed argument. The idea that, uh, let, let, let's look at it now though, from the idea that Christianity is immoral because it, it permits alcohol and sex outside of marriage. Well, I would challenge any Muslim to show me where it teaches that we can have sex outside of marriage. Uh, that's clearly not what Christians have taught for 2000 years. It's not in the scriptures. You're just making crap up. Wake up, snap out of it, Neil. You're living in a dream world. Um, but there's a more important question that we can ask about this. And we'll, we'll come on to alcohol. Um, in fact, we'll just deal with alcohol now. It, it's clear in scripture that, that Christians can drink alcohol. But it's one of those things that isn't encouraged as a good thing. It isn't something that is, is, is you know, we, we don't buy into the annihilation culture of Western civilization. Um, the, the annihilation culture of getting absolutely wasted on alcohol isn't a Christian one, but we'll come back to that. We, we believe in, in, in alcohol in moderation, um, but we, we'll come back to that. Because there's a much more important question connected around this topic which is this, for Christians, the, the, the example that defines goodness is how closely we imitate the ethic of Christ and live by his teachings. The standard of goodness for Muslims is how closely they imitate Muhammad's life, both in its form and its ethic. However, when you look at Muslims who are closely imitating Muhammad, you see human beings that are worse. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. The closer you imitate Muhammad, the worser, is that even a word? The, the worse human being you become. So for example, Islamic literature, the, 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 the biographies of Muhammad, the hadiths about Muhammad, 
portray a man that for whatever good things he might have had about him was also a warlord, a camel raider, and who taught violence and esteemed war as a good thing, who owned slaves and traded in slaves and allowed his followers to trade and own slaves and instituted a slave trade. He was an adulterer who had sex with multiple women, some of them who were his wives and some of them who were his concubines like Mary the Copt, um, uh, as well as other women that he owned as slaves. He had people murdered, criticized him, including elders, elderly men and elderly women. He had sex with a child and married her when she was six and had sex with her when she was nine. I mean, what kind of man looks at a six-year-old and thinks, do you know what? I want to marry her. Just, just think about that for a minute. And what kind of six-year-old can possibly understand what she's agreeing to in saying, yeah, I want to, have, I want to be married. No six-year-old has that cognition. Muhammad clearly had paedophilic sexual sexual uh, preferences. Yeah. There's other hadiths of him sucking on the tongue of a, a young boy. Um, it, it's clearly that the, the guy had sexual uh, sexuality that included children. Yeah, it's, it's sorry. I just want to say he was cruel to his enemies. Sorry, Bob. I just want to say that uh, it makes me Go really. It's, it really makes me think. Um, getting a picture of a 54 year old man uh, also in my head, and then. Then the same with uh, a six, nine-year-old child. You know, uh, you get that image in your head, and it's—it's it's a horrible picture. It's, it's a horrible picture. It's quite repugnant, isn't it? Mm, yeah. It is a it, really repugnant picture. Um, uh, Muhammad was cruel to his enemies when he had conquered um, his enemies. He he enslaved them and allowed them to be destroyed when he could have been more merciful. He desecrated the religious artifacts of others and disrespected others' cultures and beliefs like the pagans of his own peninsula. And yet Muslims are very complaining if you disrespect their religious artifacts. And he instituted injustices against Christians, against women, against Jews, and against pagans. Am I still coming through clearly? Yeah. Brilliant. So he instituted those things through the, the system, the, the, in, through the, the, the dictates of Sharia law. Um, his teachings encouraged a kind of hypocrisy and vainglory in that Muslims very often practice Islam for appearance sake. I mean, there is this phenomena well known, actually, amongst those that care to know of Muslims that don't believe in Islam but pretend to go along with it anyway, because the cost of not looking like a pious Muslim is too high, which means that because of Islamic apostasy laws and because of the kind of prejudices is invoked within an Islamic milieu, hypocrisy abounds and vain glory abounds because Muslims like to think that they're pious if they pray in the street or if they make a spectacle of their fasting or I mean they don't even understand that zakat is just a redistributive tax and not a charity but they'll boast as if they're giving to charity it's vain glorious many Muslims however and I want to be clear about this right many Muslims don't want to be like Muhammad and are not like Muhammad. And actually, because they don't want to be like Muhammad and are not actually like Muhammad, they're good human beings. And I want to really stress that there are lots of good Muslims. And they're good precisely because they're crap Muslims. Um, by contrast, nobody in all of my years, has ever been able to point to anyone and say that that person is better than Jesus. I mean, excluding anyone who claims to be a prophet or a religious leader, I'm talking about you and me, mm. because I'm better than Muhammad, you're better than Muhammad. Most people listening, the vast majority of people that will ever listen to this video mm -hmm. are going to be better than Muhammad, both Muslim and non-Muslim. But do you think that you're better than Jesus? 
not not even close and ditto for me i i looked up to jesus i looked down on muhammad mm. and i don't think that any muslim listening to this would say that they are better than jesus mm. and that's the point is that jesus or better than your example you need a better example jesus is that better example and those that become more like jesus become better human beings and that is the fundamental difference christ emphasized love forgiveness justice uh, internal resoluteness personal resoluteness the resoluteness of the character self-sacrifice care for the needy and the brokenhearted healing those who are, are wounded in life personal piety and self-responsibility holiness gentleness generosity the the power of inner transformation and solidarity with the covenant community that is the church amen i don't see anyone having a problem with that <laughs> i think christians need to be better at doing and following that christianity shouldn't be confused with the failures of liberal the liberal western world we christians are a minority in um the western world and by west i include america australia new zealand south africa those kinds of places you know the anglosphere the place where liberal progressive thought dominates we're a minority here um and so we shouldn't be compared to the liberal progressives as if the two things are the same um let me just hold on now though we do though we do sin in this culture i mean christians do sin in this culture because of the pressures that are put on us by this culture the drug abuses that muslims think about the sexual depravity that that that, that um muslims think about and throw on christianity or, and the breakdown of the family have actually got more to do with the, the liberal west's rejection of christianity than its practice now it's fair to say that christianity is weak in the west i mean i'm a christian in a minority community that is weak and enfeebled i'm put my hand up i'm saying that right now but because the that's because the way that we do church in the west the way that we structure ourselves isn't appropriate for the context that we find ourselves in the way we think about doing church is also incorrect our structures assume things that aren't true and deny realities that are particularly the fact that we are discipled by the world around us and christians like the rhetoric of go out and be one amongst many that's the wrong attitude christians need to invert that and be the many that sucks in the one Christians must consolidate we must collectivize we've got to retrain ourselves we've got to reorganize and then we've got to re-evangelize along the lines of politics economics society and doctrine and values and history we've got to offer the world an, an identity not a sim not a uh, not a uh, a list of doctrines to to say to give intellectual assent to western liberal societies though for all their foibles and i admit there's many are still better than islamic societies i would rather live in secular liberal progressive britain than the kingdom of saudi arabia yeah because in the kingdom of saudi arabia minorities are persecuted the poor languish in poverty across the entire islamic world slavery is still alive in the islamic world domestic abuse is rife in the islamic world despots rule in the islamic world corruption exists across islamic societies so before you point out to me things like alcohol deal with your own crap <laughs> conclusion so whilst there are failures within the christian community and and we we you know we got to hold our hand up to that 
these shouldn't be confused with the failures of liberal Western society. Those are two different kinds of failures going on, and they're not the same. A Western liberal society like France, though, is still better than any Islamic society you want to compare it to. And I would rather live in France or Germany than any Muslim country anywhere in the world. Christians seek to imitate Jesus, who makes us a better human being, whose example no one can surpass. But Muslims who become like Muhammad, in my experience, become worse human beings. Though it should be said that there are many Muslims who don't want to be like Muhammad and are not like Muhammad, and many of those Muslims are actually very good human beings. Yep. Every Christian wants to be like Jesus. Every Muslim wants to be like Jesus. But not every Muslim wants to be like Muhammad. Not every Christian, and no Christian wants to be like Muhammad. Any any questions on that argument before we go on? Yeah, well, first of all, you you right of saying that uh, you know our our friendly neighbor Muslim is uh, completely different to uh, a lot of the other Muslims that you may may think of when you're seeing and hearing all this. But th the reality is that according to Open Doors uh, World Watch report for 2020. 260 million Christians are under severe persecution, and it's 15 million more than last year. So you can only imagine what it will be next year for 2021. Mm -hmm. Will it be another 15 million? Will it be more? It's I don't know, but it doesn't look like it's going to go down. And it and it, it's time that Christians realize that the structures of our response are not appropriate to the no. problem. No, not at all. We need to change the way that we're responding to this problem. And that's got to start with a change of the way that we, we frame the problem. Yes. We should seek the liberation of our brothers and sisters, not simply to put plasters onto gaping gashes where mm. blood is flowing in the body of Christ. No. And unfortunately, our solidarity with our brothers and sisters amounts to sticking a plaster on a, a deep wound. Yeah. We, we've got to change the way we think about these things. There's nothing sacred about the way that we're doing stuff in the West. No. If we change the way we do th things, we'll have different results. This should burden anyway, us. It should burden us. It should. Us. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Mm. The cause that it says in, in scriptures that when one part of the body suffers, the whole of the body suffers. Mm. That's, yeah. that, that's a scriptural view of this. So the struggle of the Pakistani and the Filipino Christian isn't separate from us in the west the struggle of the armenian christian is not separate for, separate from us the struggle of the lebanese christian is not separate from us or the syrian christian is not separate from us or the christians in saudi arabia or in south sudan or in north nigeria or in cyprus where the exiles still live or in kosovo where they've had their land stolen or where you know or, or countless other places where or in like in indonesia or Malaysia. I mean, the, the, the list just goes on and, and it should burden us. We mm. should feel that burden. And, and as men, particularly the men of the church need to rise to the challenge yeah. and stop shrinking like the soy boys that so mm. many of us have become. Mm. And I would really encourage them to um, look into C.S. Lewis's um, um, The Need for Chivalry. And also C.S. Lewis's Men Without Chests. He's one of the, the church fathers in England. Okay, am I, am I all right to press on? Go on. So I've got two more to do and then we're done. So I'll just keep doing it going yeah. until... We're yeah, finish it. Uh, make the two. Yeah, we'll finish it because yeah. I reckon we'll, we might still be on. We might be on time. Yeah, you're doing well. So Islam is simple, pure monotheism is one of the rubrics of the Islamic Dawah script. And my answer to that is, so what? I mean, seriously, like, so what? The devil believes in one God, and so do all of his demons. Mm. Uh, what, what does it profit you to believe in one God? If following the values and the doctrines of a religion fills your heart with bitterness, anger, revenge, adultery, and vain pride, then, then what does it matter for you to say that you believe in one God? Look at the Ummah today, the Ummah, the Islamic community, supposedly the best of people. Well, 
on a multiple different on multiple different comparators they're actually the worst poorly educated economically struggling politically weak societies filled with corruption um torn apart with division and war adultery does happen in the islamic community you best believe it um the the you know the the it, it, in it, the best ummah my ass they're the best ummah they they there's nothing about muslims that makes them particularly special uh, than any other group of people incidentally though the 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 the, the christian church is by far the most charitable body of people anywhere in the world yeah we're known for our charity not for our terrorism there's a reason why muslims are known for terrorism it's because a lot of muslims are terrorists now bear in mind what i'm saying that not all muslims are bad we've we've talked about that very clearly but there is a narrative within islam that leads towards the kinds of violence and injustices that we're seeing across the world there's a reason why there's never been an emancipation movement against slavery across the islamic world that that came from the west there's a reason and that reason is the difference between jesus and his apostles and muhammad and his companions um islamic claims that it has a simple monotheism just doesn't stand up to the evidence because when you read islamic texts what you see is that allah has multiple shapes that these shapes change well if the shapes change that means god has changed right how, how does god have a shape can allah enter into his creation well i mean isn't 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 dimensional space creation um isn't vision creation um allah has body parts are, are there distinctions within his singularity does the quran his word speak to him as some hadiths talk about it that the 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 quranic recitation will take on a personified form and and speak to him so the quran is speaking back to its maker but wait it's one of the attributes of allah so how can it have a maker what does language mean um to something that's completely other than all that he's created it implies inherent contradictions to say that allah is nothing like anything that he's created but then in the next breath to say that allah is merciful well what does that even mean because mercy for me and you has a context because we have a touchstone within the created world by which mercy means something if you remove that touchstone and say that the one you're describing is not like anything you that you have any concept for then the word mercy disappears into air it doesn't mean anything incidentally so does the word one so does the word unity all of these words disappear into air islamic theology becomes babble it has inherent contradictions within its ideas of its attributes because one of the attributes of allah is that he is self sufficient and therefore does not need anything else but other attributes of allah require there to be a partner like mercy you you need you need someone to be merciful to there's a transaction occurring there or saying that allah is the creator well if allah has always been the creator who is he always been the creator to you can't be the creator without a creation so there are inherent contradictions within islamic theology um you know allah um for instance um his islamic monotheism is far from coherent and at times even compromises monotheism itself like if 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 the quran is is the uncreated word of allah but then becomes personified and advocates uh, or becomes a flock of birds and 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 advocates for the believers it intercedes on behalf of the believers then that means one of the attributes of allah is interceding to allah himself how does that make sense there's inherent contradictions within islamic you know uh, 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 islamic sources 
the source texts of Islam don't permit the boast that Muslims make, which is that they have a pure, simple monotheism. The only reason that Muslims make that boast is because most Christians are ignorant about what Islam teaches. They are shielded by the fact that most Christians are genuinely ignorant. And so the 99-1 rule applies. But when you dig into it, you find that, that Allah has a shape that people will recognize. Yep. If he has a shape, just think about that for a minute. He has a shape. A shape is a, a created or it's of the created order. Um, and, and he has a shape like you have a shape hmm. um, that Allah can enter into his creation. We'll, we'll come on to that in a, a little bit where a little bit more. Um, you know, yeah, if, if, if Allah is a singularity without plurality, how can he have 99 attributes? If, if, if Allah is a singularity with no plurality, then to call Allah merciful and to call Allah um, um, the source of life is essentially to say the same thing because we're talking about one thing here. So we're not talking about something that has plurality. That means that these descriptions don't mean anything because we're talking about a solid singularity mm. with no distinctions no nuances no colors no flavors no 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 nothing it's just a, a blob you know but how how then can we talk about him having a shin and two right hands which is hysterical um and a foot yeah. you know mm -hmm. a, a, a single foot with a shin and two right hands like i mean there is a picture of god for you mm -hmm. it's certainly up there with with Poor oh, flipping heck. I mean, it, it's quite something to, it's to a think nightmare. about. It is, yeah, really. <laughs> um, um, Islam itself, the, the whole of Islam, is a clear amalgamation of other influences, pagan, Jewish, Christian, amongst others, including Muhammad's own musings, which is the, the most important influence on Islam. Most of its practices are simply adaptions of the pagan practices that existed before Muhammad. I mean, the fact that Mecca, Mecca is a, a holy city, the, the fact that it's got a boundary that people can't, you know, enter into, that it's a place, you know, where, where the Kaaba is a focal point of religiosity. The idea that, 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 that the beauty of the Quran is in its poetry. All of these ideas were pagan. Allah himself was pagan. Muhammad's own father was called Abdullah, which means slave of Allah. Allah was worshipped as a pagan god before he was worshipped as a Muslim god. Um, there's also the clear influence and input of Judaism, the appropriation of um, figures from the Old Testament. Um, and the thing is, in terms of, uh, and that, that, that's a, the, possibly the second, the third biggest influence, you know, you've got Arab pagan, you've got Muhammad's own musings and, and filtrations, um, Arab paganism, and then Judaism. These are the three principal influences that, that and, and nearly virtually everything in Islam can be identified to those three sources. It's clearly undergone historical change and development in terms of its core beliefs, its core practices, and it's reinventing itself before our very eyes today. Um, it, within historical record, the, the, there's an attempt now to standardize the Quran that, that's been going on since 1924. And probably, I think this time, will finally succeed so that Muslims in 250 years will actually be able to say that every single Quran everywhere in the world is identical. And this time it will be true. You know? Yeah. They're going to be able to say that, I think, in 500 years, assuming that Muslims don't wake up to the fact that it's all built on a lie in the first place. Mm -hmm. The Quran uses other people's stories that we find in other books and prior to Muhammad and then is just co-opted. In the Quran itself, it says that, that one of the first accusations thrown against Muhammad is these are stories we've heard before. Why would people say that? because they'd heard the stories before and they knew it. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
Quranic recitation. So, so some of the things that have developed in Islam after Muhammad is the belief about whether Quranic recitation was created or uncreated, whether the Quran was created or uncreated itself. Uh, what's your position, the position on predestination or free will developed after Muhammad? How was Muhammad succeeded? You, you, the Sunni, the Shia and the Kawaraji all give different answers to that question. Muhammad didn't give an answer. It was developed afterwards. Whether zakat was one of the five pillars of Islam was not clear immediately after Muhammad's death. Muslims fought a war over it. They killed one another over it. So it clearly wasn't clear. Uh, they didn't fight a war over about whether um, whether you should um, um, pray, give the salat. They didn't fight a war over that. So clearly it wasn't clear at the time. Um, are the descriptions of Allah having attributes, literal or metaphorical? These are questions that have been decided afterwards and the Muslims contradict one another. The relationship between deeds or piety and one's faith which one builds it up, your deeds or your piety? How, what's the relation between the three? This was developed after Muhammad. The compilation of the Quran itself came after Muhammad. The revisions of the Quran came after Muhammad. The compilations of the Hadiths came after Muhammad. What is the canon of Hadiths that are acceptable comes after Muhammad. And you get different answers by different Muslims. The formation of the Islamic law schools developed after Muhammad. And most recently, in the last hundred or so years, there's been an undoing of that. Muslims are now, uh, Salafist Muslims are trying to reinvent Islam that does away with these law schools. The emergence of the Ashari theological school came after Muhammad. The emergence of the Maturdiya theological school came after Muhammad. The idea that there are one Quran with multiple forms came after Muhammad. So this idea that Islam is some pure monotheism is bogus. Mm. It is a collection of, of um, different ideas and sources and narratives gelled together through the prism of Muhammad and continue to develop after Muhammad's death. Conclusion. Islam is a monotheistic faith. I'm not, I'm not going to be like the Muslims are to the Christians and accuse, us, accuse them of polytheism. I think that's unfair when they do it because every Christian believes in one God. It would be wrong of us to suggest that Muslims believe in more than one God. They clearly don't. And I think Christians go too far when they say that. But its theology is definitely clumsy and is unrefined. It's far from simple and it's highly disputed and often self-contradictory. Islam itself is not a pure religion. It's borrowed from other religions and it continued to develop after the time of Muhammad, despite the fact that the Quran itself claims that the religion was completed and perfected within Muhammad's own lifetime. Well, if it was completed and perfected after Muhammad's own lifetime, why the continuing development? This is a problem. And it presupposes a perfected, the claim presupposes a perfected religion when all the evidence, a perfected and completed religion, when all the evidence demonstrates something else. Any questions on that before we move on? Just a little uh, one I want to add. Um, it's um, interesting to... Uh... Oh, it's well uh, worth to uh, mention that um, Muhammad was called, uh, had a nickname. Uh, he, got the, he got it from the pagans. Uh, he was called uh, the ear. So uh, that's, that's worth uh, mentioning. Um, mm. Yeah. Muhammad, Muhammad traveled when he was married to his first wife, Khadija. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that he was married to an elderly woman, yeah. which was a marriage of convenience, may explain some of his over-sexualization later in life. It was mm -hmm. kind of like, I missed out when I was younger. Yeah. I'm making up for it now. Yeah. It's not, it's, it doesn't take a great psychologist to spot that, you know. And, he's pre and, and, and because he was married to an elderly woman, 
for so long may explain why his sexual preferences moved in the direction of children in later life. Mm. So, I, but 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 Muhammad travelled around as a trader. He encountered people of different religions. He the, the, the argument that he couldn't read and he couldn't write is totally irrelevant. Most people at that time couldn't read and couldn't write, and most people didn't have the means to read and write anyway. Mm. Most knowledge was done from memory and repetition. And so Muhammad remembers the stories of others and then represents those stories as if they're revelations, like the story of Solomon and uh, Beersheba. Mm -hmm. No, but not Beersheba. Um, who's it? It's not Beersheba. Beersheba someone else, isn't it? Solomon. That's, that's Bathsheba is David's uh, wife. Yeah, yeah, I was going to yeah. say Bathsheba is David. Are, are you uh, thinking? Are you thinking of uh, the the queen uh, Queen Sheba? No. Um, the queen of Sheba. Yeah. Uh, Solomon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, my, my mind, my, my mind's <laughs> just gone blank. But but the, the, you know that story that you find in the Quran is a is a literal almost word for word take out of earlier Jewish texts. Mm -hmm. The idea that Jesus um, turns clay pigeons into living birds is a clear ripoff of a Gnostic gospel. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know where these stories come from. Yep. And the Muslims, the, the, the Quran itself testifies that Muhammad didn't manage to fool people in his own generation. They were saying, we've heard these stories before, yep. you know, so they weren't fooled. The thing, that, the, th the the reason why Islam came to dominate religiously is because Islam dominated politically in the Arabian Peninsula, mm. and that is something that the church needs to wake up to. Yeah, really needs to wake up to that point. That when Islam dominates politically, the church is in trouble, yep. and and Christians need to just reconcile themselves to that hard fact and deal with it accordingly. Mm. So, moving on. Yep. Okay. Final argument. Jesus cannot be God. He is only a prophet. Now, these arguments, they always draw from the texts in the New Testament that show Christ contrasted to the idea of a non-incarnate sense of deity. So that's what happens. They, they show the limits of a human being and then contrast that to a non-incarnate deity and say, well, how can these two things be the same? Which means that they're essentially ignoring completely what Christians actually believe, which is in an incarnate deity in which God limited his own divinity within creation. And they just ignore that. That's the, the point of contention, and they completely skip over it. We Christians should not be surprised that there are texts that demonstrate that Christ is a human being. Because we believe that Christ was a human being, fully human. And so there's going to be evidence to demonstrate that. And so any use of any scripture that proves that Christ is a human being is true. The question is, does it prove that Christ is only a human being? Let's just be clear about what we Christians believe about the incarnation. Christians believe that the divinity took unto itself a human nature, clothed himself in humanity, not that he transformed his divinity into humanity. We don't believe that. We don't believe that the divine changed into a human. We believe that the divine existed and took unto itself a humanity. It's a very different idea. Mm. This occurs, we Christians believe, without mingling the two natures, without confusing the two natures, without changing one nature into the other, and without separating the natures even for the blink of an eye. Thus, the knowledge of God is wholly present in the person of Jesus Christ, but not wholly accessible to the person of Jesus Christ because of the human nature. That the humanity of Christ dies on the cross, whilst the divinity of Christ goes through death untouched. 
that Christ has a human praise to God, his father, as he supplicated his father prior to his incarnation. That in his humanity, he was dependent upon his mother and father, Joseph, for care and protection. He had to sleep. He had to eat just as we do. Because the flesh, the, na the human nature that he is taken on to himself demands such things. Not that the divine becomes tired, but that the humanity becomes tired. Not that the divine becomes hungry, but that the humanity becomes hungry. The hypers and thus the divine passes through tiredness untouched, passes through hunger untouched. Because it is, it, is, it is occurring in the one person, Jesus Christ. The idea of the hypostatic union of the divinity taking onto itself humanity is like water adding onto itself ions. No one would argue that salt water is different to fresh water in anything other than their properties and attributes, i.e. its behaviours. Salt water is heavier than fresh water. If you mix salt water and fresh water together, the salt water will sit at the bottom and the fresh water will be at the top. But whilst there would be differences in properties and attributes, you can drink fresh water, but you can't drink salt water, um, no one would argue that they're different, that, that, that the substance of salt water is different from the substance of fresh water. So we're saying that the incarnate, the incarnate divinity is like salt water. The non-incarnate divinity is like fresh water. The divinity, the substance is the same. But by the taking on of an additional thing, it, you behave differently, but you remain an unchanged substance. So just to be clear, the analogy is about the divinity, not the divinity and the humanity. The analogy between fresh water and salt water is talking purely about the divinity. The only part of this analogy that is a reference to humanity is the idea of the salts in the water. Mm. The substance doesn't change just because of the addition of the ions. But the ions do change the behavior of the water. It's a change of its behavior, not of its substance. I, I hope that that is a, a good analogy. It's I, something I, I, like I only... It. I liked it, uh, to be honest. Uh, I, I wrote down some notes here about it. it it's, actually yeah. quite, it's actually quite good. Uh, did you come up with that yourself? Yeah, yeah I, thought, I thought about it as part for, for this presentation today. Yeah, but, but, but perhaps as that argument gets tested, it yeah. might fall down, and I'm open to it falling down. Of course, of course. That's um, what philosophy, or that's what part of philosophy and everything. So. Yeah, and, and it's, part of, it's part of theology. So yeah. look, we, we as Christians are allowed to describe our theologies in multiple ways, so long as we stick within the confines that are given to us by the church. And in this particular confine, we must not deny that Christ is both fully human and fully yeah, God. This is so important. But there's multiple ways of describing that. Of course. You, you, you can do that in the way of the Europeans or of the way of the African churches, and they've got different ways of doing mm. it. So another example of something that is one thing, but has two kinds of properties, um, you know, uh, a light photons that be behave with the properties of both wave and particle, and they do so at the same time. But those two ways of behaving, those two properties, don't interfere with one another's operation. So when it's acting like a pro particle, it doesn't it it doesn't stop it from acting like a wave, and when it acts like a wave, it doesn't stop it from acting like a particle but it does so at the same time, depending on, 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 on the, the context. So I'm just trying to show you that, that singular things 
can behave in distinct ways without being separate. Mm -hmm. Christ, and, and this is what we believe about the incarnation. The divinity hasn't changed, but it has taken on to itself a humanity. And that humanity has limits. The human mind can only can only process and work with so much information. Yeah. Um, Christ calls himself God, even by Muslim standards. And I, I just want to give you some references to um, to try and show that. Mm -hmm. um, bear with us. Yeah. yeah. We'll sing Bob the Builder song while waiting. Right, fair yeah. enough. Um, let's have a look. So, according to Muslims' own standards, Jesus calls himself God. In Surah 57, verse 3, Allah is described as the first and the last. In Revelations, chapter 1, 17 to 18, and in chapter 2, 22 12 to 16 christ describes himself as the first and the last in surah 24 35 allah describes himself as the light of the world in john 8 12 christ describes himself as the light of the world um let's just have a look in surah 2114 um the quran describes allah as the king in one Timothy uh, 6 verse 15 Christ describes himself Christ is described as the king in Revelation 17 14 Christ is also described as a king in um, Surah 22 62 Christ is described uh, sorry Allah is described as the truth in John 14 verse 6 Christ is described as the truth in Surah 6, 102, Allah is described as the creator. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, Jesus Christ is described as the creator. In Surah 20, 82, Allah is described as the one that forgives. In Mark chapter 2, one, uh, passage uh, 1 to 13, Christ is the one who uh, forgives. In Surah 22, 69, Allah, um, Allah will Allah is described as the one that will judge. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Christ describes himself as the one who will judge. In Surah 59, Ayah 23, Allah is described as the Holy One. In Luke 4, verse 34, Jesus Christ is described as the Holy One. Now, my question is, why has Allah stolen the divine titles of Jesus? So even by Jewish standards, Jesus calls himself God. He describes himself as the good shepherd. He describes, which means that he has called himself good. Remember, no one is good but God. Yep. Christ describes himself as the good shepherd. Therefore, he is calling himself good. Therefore, he is calling himself God. Christ describes himself as the good shepherd, which is a reference um, that is used uh, as Yahweh in the Old Testament, referring to Yahweh, he describes himself as I am. This I am is a direct use of the divine name, applying it to himself. So by both Muslim and Jewish standards, Christ calls himself God. Christ also behaves like God on earth. He commands nature by the power of his word. He says to a thing, be and it is. That's funny. That's what the Quran says. That Allah says merely to something, be, and it is. Christ says to nature, be still, and it is. That's a divine attribute. That's Christ forgives sins. Only God can forgive sins. Now, um, now many Jews, but not all, believe that God can enter into his creation. So appeals to Jews is, is a mythical thing. And also bearing in mind that the apostles were all Jews. 
So, you know, any appeals to what Jews believe is, is ridiculous because there's no uniformity on the question of God entering his creation about what Jews believe about that. And in any case, the first Christians were all Jews. There's ample evidence in Islamic literature that Allah can enter into his creation. If you read the Quran, it states that Allah is in heaven, that it, in the hadiths, Allah has spatial dimensions. It says in the Quran that you will see Allah. The thing about vision is that it is a created attribute. So by seeing Allah means that Allah has entered into an attribute that he has created. He's allowed vision to perceive him. So unless he is being deceptive and you're not actually seeing Allah, but some kind of illusion, then that means that you have seen Allah. Um, there's a story in the Quran about Moses um, saying, show, show yourself to me, Allah, and Allah going, no, if I show myself to you, you can't, you can't get it. And to prove it, what I'll do is I'll reveal myself to this mountain. And if the mountain survives, then I'll show you myself. And, and Allah reveals himself to the mountain and, and the, 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 the Hadith literature and the Islamic sources talk about Allah entering into the creation by, by this much of a finger, you know. Mm -hmm. So Allah is described as entering into the creation and it destroys the mountain and, and Moses passes out and says, OK, I was wrong. Don't show yourself to me. I couldn't cope with it. But that means that Allah entered into his creation. Mm -hmm. Yep. If he can enter into his creation by this much, why can't he enter into his creation by more? The fact is, you've you've already broken the barrier yep. by that story. You know, um, and the ideas of the ideas of yeah, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's it's kind of like you can't you can't have that kind of story and then say Allah hasn't entered into his creation. It's too um, in, too much inconsistency. Yeah, it's completely yeah. inconsistent. Um, the, the idea of Allah speaking from a burning bush, unless you're willing to separate the voice of Allah from Allah himself, you know, then which is which is shirk because you're mm -hmm. dividing you're dividing the attributes of Allah. Then that means where the voice of Allah is, Allah himself is present, which means that Allah is speaking from the burning bush. He even describes and says and says, "I am Allah." It actually he's actually saying that from the burning bush. Which means that Allah has entered into his creation. My favorite is a hadith story where Muhammad says, uh, where, where Muhammad says that he couldn't see Allah because Allah is veiled in light. Okay. That means that there is a created thing that can veil Allah. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is a created thing that can veil Allah, then why can't Allah? surround himself in his creation in flesh if there is a light that allah can create that is greater than the light of allah so that it veils allah then 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 um why can't he uh, veil himself in flesh yeah. now, the thing is if if we say that the light that allah that the muhammad said veiled allah is the light of Allah, then that means that Muhammad was wrong for saying that he had never could not see Allah because Allah was veiled in light. So Muhammad would be wrong. Mm -hmm. If Muhammad said, if if Muhammad actually was the one who was had a, a veil put over his eyes that was light, then that means that Muhammad was spoke wrongly of Allah because he said that Allah was veiled in light, not that he was veiled in light. Hmm. So the, the the reality is that Islamic sources are full of contradictions. Mm. And, and the best analogy to the incarnation is this. This is meant to be the words of Allah. Mm -hmm. And yet here I am holding it in my hand. That is an incarnation of a kind. That's analogous yeah. to the incarnation. Yep. An infinite attribute of Allah in physical form. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, the Islamic arguments against the idea of the incarnation are ridiculous, self-refuting and self-contradictory. But more importantly, the idea of the incarnation is a better revelation than this Quran. This Quran apparently only exists in Arabic. And if you change the words of this Quran, then you've changed the words of Allah and it ceases to be um, revelation. The incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ means that stories the, the story of his life death and resurrection can be told about him and that means that that story can be translated into any language it can be communicated to any people 
And what is better, me sending you, you meeting and talking with me in person, Daniel, or me just sending you a letter about myself, which will, which will reveal myself to you more clearly? Of course, uh, meeting in person. Yeah. And which is a better king? A king who deigns to come and speak to you directly or one through whom you only ever receive dictates and letters and you never get to see ever? Well, I say the king of kings that uh, dove down into his creation and saved us uh, yeah. and met us in person. Every, 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 every leader who is willing to mix with the ones that he leads yeah. is the more noble king. Yeah. Can I just take so an example? The, very quick example. The vision example. that we have of Yahweh as our king. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just one quick example. Uh, the past king we had in Norway... Uh, King Olaf, uh, he uh, used to take the uh, trance, you know, the underground, uh, you have it in uh, in London, this metro or this underground. Mm. He used to take that and he was called uh, the people's king. Yeah. Yeah. People love, people love leaders who will, who will, who will mix with them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that is true. Are we saying that Allah doesn't know this? And yet we as Christians believe that Yahweh is our king and we love him precisely because he was willing to mix with us. Yeah. And that's what inspires us to love him. So faithfully that Christians are dying for his name. Yeah. But who is, who is this foreign God that Muslims are dying for? Even they don't know. All they have are dictates sent to them by envoys. A God that has never deigned to speak to them directly. And what's the Muslim argument? Because it isn't befitting of his glory. Well, I agree with you. It is not befitting of royalty to mix with the common folk. But there is something still inspiring about a king that is willing to do so. I agree with you. It is not befitting the glory of God to become human. And if... And that speaks to the vision of the God that we worship, that our God is a God of love, that even though it is not befitting of his glory to enter into his creation, he does so anyway. But what kind of God is it that thinks, what, what kind of image of God is it that, that says to himself, it's not befitting of my glory to enter into my creation, and then doesn't? What kind of, if we met a king who, who, who said to himself, like imagine the king of Norway, who said it's not befitting of my royal royalty to mix with the common man and kept himself aloof in his palace, only ever sending out letters. What, what, what image would we have of that king? Mm -hmm. yeah. It would be of a lesser leader, a less noble leader. And this is the superiority of the God Yahweh over this pagan Arab invention um, that Muhammad co-opted. His vision of God is ignoble by comparison. And thus the, 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 the incarnation is a better universal message of who God is and what God wants than the Quran which is not clear and of which Muslims argue completely about. So conclusion, it's not unreasonable, nor is it contradictory to believe in a God who can enter into his creation and who can be known from doing so. Islam, by contrast, either has to act, has either has an unknowable God uh, filled with a religion of self-contradictory passages about Allah entering into his creation. I mean, it literally says in the Quran that Allah is in heaven and Allah it created heaven. It literally says in the Hadith that Allah descends in the night, in the evening, to listen to the prayers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll leave you to think about the 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 the, the issue that arises from a global earth that has continuous night and day and the idea of Allah descending and ascending to listen to the evening prayers. Just think about that. Clearly, Muhammad believed in a flat earth. Um, the incarnation is a superior doctrine to um, Islamic teaching. And it speaks to the kind of God that we worship. 
that we Christians acknowledge that it is not befitting of the glory of God to enter into his creation. But he is of such a loving God that he does it anyway. Vis-a-vis a God of Muhammad that either cannot do something because it is beyond his power to do it. Which means that he is an all-powerful God. Or a God that can do it but looks upon his creation with such disdain that he won't because it isn't befitting of his glory. It's for you to choose. And that my friend, brother is the end of our presentation. Oh, that, that was, that was really good. Really good. I enjoyed that. And I hope uh, my, i I'm sure my viewers will, uh, will enjoy that too. And, uh, and I'm really grateful that you came to, uh, my channel and to uh, lecture us about this. Uh, this is uh, something that is so important and it's just it's just being ignored uh, just as much as uh, the persecution of Christians are in the world. We, we just we are sleeping. Uh, I we really have to step up our game. Amen. Yes, mm -hmm. we absolutely do. And I, I, I just want to say that that for me, I, I'm trying to live out a vocation now. Mm -hmm. And so Part of, you know, Christ calls us to use our talents and our skills to edify and to build up the church. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeking to do. So, you know, it's my honor to come onto your channel to serve you and to serve your listeners in whatever way that I can. Um, and, you know, and, and, and we, we, if we Christians practice this economy of using our talents, our gifts and our skills to support one another, the church will revive. Yeah. And I will encourage anyway. my I will encourage my uh, my listeners to do check out uh, uh, Bob's channel. I will leave the links in the description box. And also, uh, I know it's hard times as this is uh, this is 2020 and coronavirus and everything. But if you have any chance, if you have uh, if you are capable, um, do consider to uh, support him on Patreon. He's trying to go full time uh, and doing this. Uh, in he's so active in Speakers Corner. He's uh, doing very important work there, being very brave. Uh, you, you don't get liked uh, very much when you do this kind of kind of things and he has a lot of knowledge to um to educate uh, other apologists so do consider that and uh, yeah again bob i uh, really appreciate you coming and may god bless yeah. you and keep you and strengthen you and use you thanks be to god just before we close in prayer yeah. um i i i want to say that part of my vocation is to help churches and to help individual Christians. So if I can bless any fellowships or any individual Christians in this, then, you know, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Um, so do get in touch. Okie dokie. Shall we uh, close in prayer? Yeah. You want? Okay. Uh, I've got a, Some, yeah. I've got a prayer to read. Yeah. yeah. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware our forefather Abraham, that he would give us, that we being delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. I have another one. One yep. second. Nor, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, 
which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to God the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, into the ages of ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. God bless you, bro. God bless you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.